Alongside my buddy, Bernie Neighbors, I'm Jeff McCarriger, and this is Borderline. Thanks for joining us again for another week. Um, so what, 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 epi- what episode are we on? Like 95? What, you know, it's what, funny. What? We're, 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 <laughs> like, like, I felt like we were like, like, I felt like we got to like 25, like pretty quickly. Yeah. And I felt like we got to 50 and we were like, damn, we're like 50. Right. And now I went to plug in the number to log on to StreamYard. And it was 65, and I'm like, really? Only 65? Now it feels like uh, 100, and it's only been 65. <laughs> I know. But like, when we get 75, we're going to be like, wow, 75. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's probably yeah. so. Yeah. No, but, uh, and, and I was thinking to myself, when we get to 100, like, like do we celebrate? Like, when we, we have to. Do we, is that we the one that we, is that the one that we make it live? Do we make our 100th episode oh. live? Oh. Yes, I like that idea. I just, I just don't like the logistics of it. Right. I'm, I'm just, I'm just. It just causes. I don't, I don't like it when we record, as you know. Right. Let alone, let alone we go live. We can try it, and you know what? If it bombs, well, maybe, maybe we do. Maybe we do like a like a 100th show special. And if it bombs, who cares? And we record another one anyway. Well, what if you know if we do a live one, we do it at one of the nationals or wherever where someone else is there, whether it's Trey, Wally, someone else, and they can kind of produce. <laughs> yeah. So you can, so, help us. <laughs> well, no, so you can, you don't have to worry about it. You know what I mean? So you, that would be so, fun. so then when we're live, we can actually interact with people that are there and, and the chat yeah. and all that kind of fun stuff. That's the I thing. I still, fun. I still do think it'd be fun to, to have the chat factor. I mean, it's we're, all, we're, we're actually getting close to it. I don't think we're quite there yet. But I think we're getting close, maybe within a year or two, of actually having a daily show. Don't you think? I think that you, was the I mean, you and process. I could feel, you and I could easily do a sports talk show because we could talk all kinds of other sports. Right. Um, I think I, that I, was I think the thought. Getting, I think we're getting close to it. Yeah. I think that was the thought when they came up with the twenty-four hour, you know, channel. The thought was there would be a sports center, if you will, of cornhole. Yeah. And I, I think that was a thought. I think that's like, you know, they're kind of waiting, like you're saying, we need enough stuff going on where it can be a daily show. Because right now, I mean, with our show, ACL Live, um, God, my brain's not working, Trey and Anthony and Michelle's show. And then you've got... Around the uh, ACL. Around the ACL, thank you. And... They're going to hate you <laughs> that you forgot that. I know, I, to my brain. It's, it's, it's <laughs> nothing personal. But then you've got Wally and Michelle's show, you know, we're, we're filling up a week. So there is a daily show almost, but it's not, you know, a, a quote yeah. unquote sports center type show where it's, you know, two, two anchors at a desk going over the daily happenings in the cornhole world. I, I don't know. Well, actually. All right. So now we're talking about, what do you think? Do you think there's enough information to fill That's that? The thing. I think, I think it's close. Um, I, again, I think you and I can, because we talk about enough other outrageous topics Right. I think I think you and I could could easily do it. But as far as the actual news, especially especially if our season is going to be, you know, if if the meat of our pro schedule is going to be April through September, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but but you know, a big part of that could be teams because the draft was a big deal. Right. So depending depending on the the headlines that come out of teams and you know the trades and the trade deadline that kind of stuff, and then the I, I think I think what's really cool is the off season. I mean, it's almost becoming like the NFL and the NBA offseason. I get it. It's not the NFL and the NBA. I get it. But the <laughs> fact that we have these teams changing, right? Right. And doubles partners and the drama that that is that. And the fact just, that many of these are one-year contracts, I, I think yeah. I, that that is interesting to me. I love the, the, that. The offseason is just so short, man, that the, uh, you know, the Opens happen so fast. I mean, you yeah. know, you're right there in October and the Opens are starting. Right. And, you know, last year, when did we end? First weekend or second week? in september from because mm-hmm. you know going out to la and doing that after the world championships i mean so the, what was there three and a half weeks of a quote-unquote off season off season right yeah I, I don't know i mean because you know for the players i mean for us because we you and i specifically are so into the nationals and so into the shootouts right that's kind of our world yeah there is a big gap for all of that i mean that doesn't really start till january for the players, I mean, the Open's like, you know, October. They're right back into it. I mean, they're, yeah. and they're always playing, you know, blind draws, so on and so forth. But, you know, there's so many of those. Does that actually even 
is it worthy? God, I'm probably going to offend people when I say this. Is it, you know, are those even worthy of bringing up to a, a, a you know, a, a, a cornhole center type show? You know what I mean? Like, does, can you even talk about those? Yeah, because, I think that's, that's the thing. I think we're close. I'm not sure we're quite there yet. Yeah. But, but because, because right now, I think where the sport is at, I think it's good to push it um, in line with all the main nationally televised pro events. Like, I think if we start throwing cornhole in everyone's face 12 months out of the year, right? I don't know. I don't know if there's quite, I don't know. You may risk a little bit of burnout in that message. Especially so I don't know national. If, I don't know if I don't know if the demand for the consumption of the cornhole headlines and material is quite there yet to have the interest of you know 24 7 12 months. But I think it's definitely there for five or six months out of the year. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And you know, and it's funny because there are people that are gonna watch this and be like, What are you talking about? It's all I talk about, you know, but that's you know what, yeah. 10, 15, 25,000 people that are truly invested daily. You know, it runs their life, maybe 50, right. you know, but it's, you know, like you're saying for a national exposure type thing, I think, I mean, there's a reason a players get burnt out and NFL injuries, but there's a reason why you don't have year long seasons. Because after a yeah. while, no, oh, one's no I mean, sure. baseball, baseball sort of struggle, now. baseball struggles with it now. Their season's so long that, you know, when you look at TV ratings for a regular season baseball game, not that great. No, I, think, I, think, I think Cornhole's beaten beaten regional NBA and MLB games just because yep. you know it's it's so it's so market specific when the year just drones on. Whereas we have a national audience, right. like literally coast to coast, and people are interested. Yeah. So as long as you keep that to five or six months right now, I think it's. I think I'm with you. Good. I agree. I agree. Yep. By the way, I not to switch uh, subjects here, uh, but uh, I I cannot wait for our guest today. Oh, like absolutely. I'm super stoked. Like we've wanted to have this guy on for a long time and I cannot wait to talk to him. We'll, we'll get, we'll get him on here in about five minutes, but uh, I, I'm really, I'm really yeah. excited because I like, I like, I like the direction of our show and mm -hmm. I like the personalities um, that, that come out. And this is a dude who is probably one of my favorites. I'm probably most intrigued with this guy. I am. I mean, he's always been one of my favorites. I mean, he, and, you know, every, once, once they see who it is, everyone will be like, oh, they'll understand what we're talking about. But, you know, he's a guy that his heart's on his sleeve. You know, you don't yes. have to wonder where his head's at. You know what I mean? And I think some players, look, there's something to a cornhole professional or any other professional athlete that is reserved. And, you know, you get your stock answers when you ask questions, right? You know, you get cliche after cliche after cliche. And yeah. it's great. It's fine. But it's, it's a breath of fresh air when someone's got their heart on their sleeve. I mean, that's why I look, you remember when Charles Barkley played in the NBA in the eighties? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, was there a better interview? You never had to worry about some sort of, you know, taking it one game at a time, da, 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 all that kind of stuff. You didn't have to worry about that coming out of his mouth, yeah. right? You were going to get an amazing answer. Even if he, even more so when he was bored with the question, you were going to get an even better answer at that point. But yeah, yeah, that's no, I'm su I'm super stoked. He, he's got a couple things he wants to talk about, but, um, I've got a couple things that I really want to talk to him about as well, that I think are important, ex extremely important to the future of the game. And one of them that we've talked about before is how do we want this game to look and feel? Mm -hmm. You know, and I know we've hit on this before, but this is going to be a great guy to talk to it about. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, why and, and you know bernie actually this is a good question for you and, and then we can get we can get his thoughts when he comes when he comes on but why is it golf and why does it have to be golf you know i mean we, we we're really quiet right now was it was let me ask you let's start here first was cornhole um like this prior to covid or was there more energy and more emotion prior to covid no i, th I think it was the same was you it? know okay. i think it's because my so first whatever. experience came came. Just, I mean, my my first experience was you know outside of the collegiate national championships. My first right. gig with y'all was was in February of 2020. Right, right in the middle you of know, it. Yeah. Ju just before, just before we all set off for Cleveland. Right. <laughs> so really, so really, my career with cornhole started that that <laughs> that that, uh, that COVID summer, and 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 obviously no one was allowed 
in the venue. I mean, it was the players and the camera guys, you, me, Trey, Stacy. Yeah. That was about it, right? Yeah, I mean, there's nobody so. in there. So it was it was obviously quiet. So I didn't know if that so so that was kind of you know my first you know, I, I remember Florida. I remember Florida being loud, but so I was wondering if COVID really kind of tamped everything down or uh, I think it's always from from my recollection, and I haven't been in it as long as other people, you know, but it, from my recollection, when you get to the, well, quite frankly, before we came along, when you start talking about national television broadcasts and how those are viewed, you know, from a crowd perspective, there was nothing before the ACL that was like that. I mean, the, the way it was before would be like how our streaming stuff is when we get to the end of brackets, you know, where people start to kind of bring their chairs around and yeah. everyone's kind of in the any everyone in the, in the you know the gym essentially is kind of around but that was it that was as big as it got now it's bigger but everyone is kind of watching as if it's tennis at times like you know it's like you can't yell and scream in the middle like, i don't know it's yeah and i don't, no, I don't good. know I, like that. I don't, you're, you're I don't right. know exactly where to go with it though i mean i you, I don't want people like when someone's getting ready to shoot, all of a sudden you've got 25 people screaming right as they're shooting. I don't know. Yeah. You know, what, like in free throws, I, I, you know, in a How basketball, about- I, I don't know if that's necessary, but I think there does need to be n- more excitement. Does music need to be playing the whole time? I don't know. But then you've got to go through well, what music can be played. How expensive is that during a broadcast? Cause you know, you can't do that. Yeah. Well, we talked about this on a conference call recently. I like what the NBA does. I like, you know, that beat that they play from time to time. Um, that's that that is that they play kind of in transition from one end of the court to the other. Mm-hmm. But then, but then they kind of fade it out. I, I I I'm a huge fan of that because it kind of breaks the silence. I don't know if the players would like that or not. I mean, I don't I don't find it distracting. The NBA guys obviously don't find it distracting, but. But yeah, I, I'd be a fan of that. But let me yeah. let, let me rephrase that question instead. How about how about this? Are the personalities have the personalities on the court been tamped down since COVID, or has been has there been a change of personalities? Because I feel like, and maybe it's just small sample size. I feel like when I first got into this game, Trey Ryder sent me clips, right? Mm-hmm. A, a lot of clips that I could watch, so I could learn the sport and kind of learn how to you know the vernacular and how to broadcast it. And I felt like there were some big time personalities in the game. Do you feel like the game has fewer personalities on the court? I do. And part of it is also when they started miking the players, right? Because you're losing some of the personality when you mic players and then ESPN comes back or whomever comes back and says, hey, we can't have the cursing. We can't have you know any of this conversation when they're mic'd. Yeah. Well, that's going to tamp down the players because obviously coming from Stacey and Trey, if you're sitting there cussing on the mic, he's got a problem with that. Both of them, you know, because you can't have that because we don't want to lose the ability to go on national television. So I think that has tamped some things down. I think, okay. you know, with the last few rookie classes, at least the last two, there's so many kids that the kids haven't even grown into themselves yet. Right. So I don't even know what kind of true personality you're getting from them. And so many of them are just quiet. They're, they're small town, quiet kids. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But when you're talking about big personalities, you're not going to get that from them. I mean, maybe if the Gores get to the point where we're seeing them on television a lot, you're going to see that. Maybe... You know, you've still got like our guest coming up when he's on. You're still going to see that, you know, like a Cody Henderson who had a great week this past weekend making the finals and yeah. singles. You know, you're you're still going to get that from certain people. But, you know, when when the words coming from on high, don't act like a jackass when you're mic'd up and on national television. I think people are thinking that way. Don't act like, you know, which you don't have to be a jackass to show to show personality. And I think that's what people struggle with. You know what I mean? Like so, you don't have so to. So would be it be open. worth not miking the players I've, to bring that to bring that energy and that emotion? And, I've and never, that I've never understood why we mic the players, and this is just my personal opinion. Because I've always been a fan of it, but but you're starting to make me think. You know what? Well, who, maybe maybe we shouldn't do that. Outside of two or three players, you're not really getting really any good self talk anyway. All you're getting is conversation sometimes between if it's doubles between teammates. And then what, what else are you really getting? So most players aren't really going to give you self-talk anyway because they're in their head. They're not really talking out loud. A Ryan Smith, for example, I think he's aware when he, like especially in shootouts, when he gets mic'd up, I think he's aware he's mic'd and he's kind of giving us that. You know, I, I think he does talk to himself a little bit, but I think he's aware. You're talking a really small number of people are going to give you that. Otherwise, all you're getting 
is anger reactions when they miss a shot that they want to make, right? And a lot of times that's going to be cuss words. That's they're human beings, they're adults playing a sport. You're going to get that. Well, if that's a problem, then let's not mic them because I still want to see that. And you're still going to be able to see it on camera when they get excited or yell. Like you're going to see them be demonstrative demonstrative yeah. on camera. But the moment they're mic'd up and everyone's telling them not to act a certain way, well, you are tamping them down. So I think the miking of the players has actually led to the players being a little less emotive when they're playing, personally, my personal opinion. I wonder, I wonder if there's a happy medium, Bernie. I wonder, instead instead of miking the players, I wonder if there's a happy medium right. to where... Right, on the court. To where we could almost almost like they do in when when you're recording a movie, there's just a hanging mic, uh, and 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 obviously we don't have the we don't have the personnel for someone to be standing there with a mic. Well, maybe but, maybe but the maybe hyperbolic mics hang. that they use in football on the sidelines and put them in the corners, or or just hang one from the trusses above each one of the boards that hang sure. right down, and and the and maybe maybe we just let the players know. Listen, um, at those moments during timeouts is when those mics will be live. Right. But then, I, other than that, but then other than that, because I, because there, I don't know, I just I just feel like like we need to start seeing more of that 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 emotion. Like last year during the World Championships was incredible, right? And and you know the what happened with Jordan Power and Jay Rubin and that come from behind win and the words that were exchanged and spoken. It's great. Um, it's yeah. great. But how it's many just, players? I think, we, I think we need more of that. How many players can do that without cussing? And that's what it comes down to because the networks yeah. don't want to hear it. And so then everyone says, well, you can't cut. Well, most people, I'll talk, I'll, you know what? I won't say most people. I'll say me, for example. If I'm playing in a high pressure situation like that and I get mad or I start talking a little smack, there's going to be some length, some adult language. I mean, that's just part of it. I mean, I think more people are like that than are controlled. Personally, yeah. that's my personal opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that I am because we see it all the time. I mean, how many times have we had the mics on players and then all of a sudden in the truck, they've got to turn them off. Yeah. I and mean, that's happened a lot. And I just, I think you're taking something away from their natural reactions. I mean, they are adults. They're, they are playing for money. I mean, they're playing for pride and money. You're going to get some blue language. You just are. It happens in every single sport, even golf and tennis sports like that. Guys get upset and they yell and cuss. Yeah. I guess, I guess in my favorite sports that I like to watch, like you and I, before we came on, we were talking about football and you know, they don't, they don't, they obviously don't mic the players right. for, for us, for us to hear live, but they have the hyperbolic mics on the sidelines that and you, you can still, ca yeah, you can still capture, yeah. you know, th and the excitement and the emotion of the game is not lost. It's still, it's still there now. Now, maybe that's a bad comparison, obviously, because it's high contact sport, but right. I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty torn between this because I really do like Mike and the players. Like I love to hear the chatter and, and the strategy talk and some of the self-talk, right. but, but on the flip side, if it is taking away from the natural emotion, um, you know, and well, the raw right. reaction of it, then, then I, I don't think, know, but, maybe we need to think about it. But let me ask, let me ask you a question. Who do you hear self-talk from? Give me five players. Because I don't think you um, can. Well, it's hard for me because, well, Ryan Smith, obviously number one. All right, that's one. Um, Jamie Graham, you get you get a little bit of self talk with him. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, mean, uh, I don't know, little. Yeah. All right, that's two. Um, Yeti or one. I thought it was I thought I thought I thought it was great to get Yeti's emotion. Maya Cup, great to hear her emotion. Um, is that self talk or is that yelling for a shot? Like, so when I'm talking self talk, I'm talking more Ryan Smith talking his way through a shot. The other stuff is just oh, yeah. emo emotional responses. Now, I think you get that from tons of people. Yeah, the but same again, you, you only get from a handful. You're right. But the right. emotion is what I like to hear. Yeah, and the emotion for most adults when they're playing, in, especially men, when they're playing in high-pressure situations like that, you're going to get a lot of blue language, which I don't have a problem with. The networks have a problem with it, which I understand. You've got families, yeah. you've got kids, all that kind of stuff. But I don't know, man. I, I just think when you're – when it's come down from Stacy and Trey and others, like, hey, you can't be this way. Well, then let's not mic them. Let's, you know, let's think that's, about that's the exactly my point. Maybe we really need to like consider that just to bring just to bring that emotion back. Like, so, so on some of these clips, like I was talking about, right? That Trey would have shown me from 2017, 18, 19, right? Right. Were the players mic then or no? No. I don't remember them being mic'd, but maybe in 2018, maybe 20, maybe 2019. I don't remember that at all in 2018. Yeah, so, I don't know. Worth, I don't worth know. a thought. 
Yeah. Uh, we, we've got a great guest today who we can talk to this a lot about um, while he's getting set up. Um, I love our bag manufacturers, by the way. Uh, it, it's so great for me to be able to actually touch and feel and now throw different bags. They are all so different. People on TV who are watching on TV have no idea. And I really think we need to kind of develop the storyline a little bit more. In the are they sending you bags, Jeff? Well, a few have. I mean, Mike, Mike uh, Hennessy, you know, handed out some bags to us at the end of, uh, of Spencer McKenzie's last year. Well, so I got yeah, some the Spencer McKenzie bags. Jason McCannon yeah. gave me some fire assaults because when I first met him, um, Frank gave me some, uh, um, you know, of, of his, of the Game Changer bags when I first met him. Uh, I bought some from Reynolds. Um, uh, I got some from, from, I got some Ultra bags from Mark Man. after we had him on the show. Hold and, on, and now, and now, and now, hold, hold, uh, hold, hold on. Hey, bag manufacturers, I've received <laughs> nothing. Zero. Well, but you have to have conversations with them. I talk to people all the time. I mean, I'm not going to beg for bags. You well, know, you want me to talk about your product? Let me see your product. Yeah, show me some love. Well, anyway, so there you so, go. so <laughs> the, the most recent ones that I told you about when we we're out in Arizona, I'm looking forward to getting these are my cornhole scenario bags. I've heard so many awesome things about cornhole scenario. Never played with them. So, but I'm going to get some Cat 3s. And I'm looking okay. forward to, to there you go. Look at you, man. But I do I do pay for some of them. And I off I always offer to pay. Right. Uh, but they're all they're all just so great because I think they want us to learn and touch and feel and talk about their bags. So absolutely. So anyway, so I'm looking forward to getting some of those. <laughs> by the by the way, my throw my throw is looking good. I know you told me. I, I, I mean, pretty... I'm cautiously optimistic, but I was throwing last night. Holy shit, dude. It was like like Kathy came in and she's like, wait a second. She's like, what the hell was that? She was like, that was like a legit flat bag with spin. I'm like, I know, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, who knows, yeah, Jeff? Before before you know it, you're going to be in Mount Pleasant in Charleston finding your local blind draw on Tuesday nights. Just, uh, yeah. You'll start as a comp time. player, you know. If it's I okay. <laughs> All right, I it's, think it's a great night out. I can't it's family tell time. if our guest is frozen. Okay, good. I think he's ready. All right, let's get to this. I've been looking forward to this for a while. So our guest today, um, he is no stranger to those in the sport of cornhole and you talk about emotional players i mean one of the toughest guys in the sport this is probably the first name that comes to mind for for the people in the sport for those who don't know him um he you have to watch him play again an emotional player passionate player he absolutely loves the sport um finished finished one of the top 100 players in the world last year made an incredible run at Spencer McKenzie's and for those of you who don't know about Spencer McKenzie's maybe you've heard us talk about it it it's probably Bernie correct me if I'm wrong it's got to be the toughest tournament to win right you literally have a thousand teams in California and it's everybody I mean it's right. everybody across the country and and Trevor who we're gonna have on here in a second and Berkeley made a run all the way to second place and still got like fifteen thousand bucks or something like that um, made an incredible run. So it was great to see him do that. But um, anyway, one of my favorite personalities in the sport and uh, have been looking forward to this interview for a long time. Please welcome to Borderline for the first time. That's right. Trevor Brooks. What's up, Trevor? What's going on? Man, I'm so glad we could finally hook up with you. Bernie and I, I how long, Bernie, have you and I been saying we got to have Trevor on? We got to have Trevor months, on. Months, months and months. Yeah. What's going on, Bernie? What's up, brother? All right, Trevor, out, hey, man. hey, are you are you in uh, the the stats say you're in Duncan, South Carolina? Is that where you're at? Are you in the upstate? Um, about an hour and a half from Duncan. I'm I'm in the upstate, but I moved back from to my hometown about three months ago, uh, Greenwood, South Carolina. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't even realize that you were in the upstate because I'm down in Charleston. So. Yeah, you about three hours from me. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So give us just a little bit of background because I, we, we were just talking about a huge topic that I want to talk to you about, but, um, give it, give us a little bit of your background. You and I were talking about this. So you actually like, like, I want, I want to like dive into who is Trevor Brooks? Like, right. We see the tough guy on TV. We see the loud, emotional player, <laughs> awesome cornhole player, top 100. But like, I want to know like where you come from. You know, and, and what what your journey's been like? Like, and I, I know you told me that you started working at, at a golf course when you're early, early in your life. Worked in heavy machinery for, machinery for ten years, and and uh, now you're in fire safety. But um, yeah, I mean, what 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 was your life growing up? And 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 you know, brothers and sisters, family, that kind of stuff. 
That's a lot to unpack, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. We got time. <laughs> Let me take a swallow of my beer here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by the way, Bernie, if we keep doing these night podcasts, we got to have like a vodka soda or some shots or something. Right? There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, where do I start? All right, spill the beans, Trevor. Let's go. Um, I, right before I jumped on, I heard y'all talking about Spencer's, and I don't think anybody knows this, but Ron Windsor is probably one of the best people to, to – he runs California, basically. You know, but, <laughs> but, but I will say that there's nobody ever that has higher finishes than me in, in, at Spencer McKenzie's. I've been there five times. In, five years out of six, I skipped one year whenever – in the, in the three-year span that I quit, I only skipped one. I still played two of them, and I got a, I got a win. I got a second. I got a second. I got a fifth, and I got a seventh. So I got five top seven finishes there in five years. So that's strong. That mm. is strong. So, so is, is that because you're such a good outdoor player? Because that turn, one of the things that makes that turn, tournament so different is how hard it is, especially when that wind kicks up. I mean, that is yeah, a well, tough tournament. When I started 10 years ago, cornhole was an outside sport. You know, we played most of the big tournaments were outside. True. And so I feel like it's more of a grind. Not The outside elements don't really affect that much because you, you can see guys. Everybody's going to play down. Nobody's going to play perfect. But the thing about being outside is a grind. You got to be – it's a mental grind all day, you know, so you can't never give up. It's a, it's a whole lot different than being inside and being comfortable in 72-degree weather with no wind – and the yeah. boards playing consistently all day. It's a lot of elements that change throughout the day that you got to adapt and you got to stay mentally focused and you got to stay positive throughout the day. And a lot of people ain't prepared to do that. All right. All right. All right. All right. So Bernie but, is uh, letting you off the hook by geeking out on cornhole all of a sudden. Back up a second. Right, so, so tell me, so, so seriously, like where did you grow up? Do you have a brother, brothers and sisters, mom and dad? Like, like what was your family life like? Um, I do have two brothers. I'm a middle child. Um, there's three years separates the three of us. Uh, my older brother is 32. I'm 31, and my younger brother is 30. Oh so gosh. we grew up. Yeah, we grew up pretty rough. Um, yeah, our parents. Uh, we've lost both of them. We lost uh, our dad when we was nine, and I lost my mom last year. Uh, eight or nine months ago, I lost my mom. So, yeah, growing up is, was kind of rough. You know, it, that's that ain't for a podcast, um, but it's. It's that's our podcast, man. That's what we talk. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I lost. I lost my dad what a, a month before my ninth birthday. Mm-hmm. So I was just gonna I, say, I, I thought it was nine years old. Same, same, same yeah. thing as Trevor. Mm, yeah, I was nine. Mm, yeah, it sucked. Uh, but <laughs> I grew up. I, I grew up uh, with his with his brother, my uncle. He was really close to me. Um, today actually marks a year that my uncle had passed, and uh, me and my cousin, as you know, Bubba, we're really close. We play together a lot. Um, he was kind of idle with me growing up i looked up to him he took me fishing he, he was the, really the only father figure i ever had coming up and uh and yeah today marks a year so it's kind of been an emotional day for me and my cousin both and we work together so it's been a silent day <laughs> yeah you know but uh when it comes to parents yeah they don't have any of them uh i believe all my grandparents are about gone all of them are gone yeah so it's just me and my cousin and uh upbringing wise it's greenwood i mean you can look it on it's population about 50,000 I don't know we had we was a 4A school we won a couple state titles when I was in school we had a lot of great ball players that made it to the league as well I I still watch some of them to this day there are some good ball players and I I don't know I I never I didn't pick up cornhole until I was 21 22 something like that Uh, golf really uh consumed my life growing up it it consumed me to just that was my getaway to stay out of trouble you know <laughs> but when it comes to when it comes to cornhole over the last 10 years it's cornhole is uh is has really changed my life over the last 10 years it's uh my game my life would have took a different route if it wasn't for cornhole so i i owe it all to the game and this is really like to me my second win coming back i feel like I'm going to give back to the game. The game's given to me, and I'm going to give back to the game. I'm going to help the game grow this time. And uh, that's really what it all boils down to. This year is so, going to be an incredible. Mm-hmm. So why, if you don't mind me digging in on that a little bit, so why did golf and cornhole keep you more on the straight and narrow? Like, were there temptations? Were you used? I mean, are you one of those, are you one of those guys? Where, and I think, I think it's true for a lot of us, um, where you use sports to keep you from going down a different direction? Sure. 
Sure. Yeah, of course I did. I, I like to run. I ran cross country for, for several years and played soccer for about 10 years. And the competitive nature was always there, but I was just a troubled child, you know, just like anybody else in a, in a parent list home, you know, we, it was, it was kind of rough growing up. So golf came into play. It just, you know, I definitely got in my share of trouble, you know, like fighting a lot of trouble coming up. I didn't get introduced to golf till I was 14. Uh, I moved in with my grandfather and he was, you know, I have a golfer for 40, 50 years and he taught me the game of golf and it completely changed my demeanor as a person first. So obviously thankful of, for golf, but I never got good enough to where I could compete on a pro tour or anything. You know, I got down to a scratch handicap and, yeah. and, and played some, played some, some really big tournaments, won some nice, won some nice tournaments playing golf, but I never feel like I could hit another gear. I just didn't have the teaching or the money or the backing or the funding. And I never, I wasn't a country club kid. So I, like I said, I cut grass as a 15, 16 year old kid just to play free golf. You know, they paid me like $6 an hour or $7 an hour when I was in high school. And I knew all these kids that I, you know, that, that were playing while I was cutting grass. And when they was going home to hang out with their kids, I would get off work and go play nine holes walking, you know, for free. And golf was kind of my outlet to just reassess myself as a person, uh, becoming a young man, trying to fit, you know, figure out where I fit in in the world. And cornhole, cornhole didn't come till after I had children. Like I played golf seven days a week. I would work and play. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to practice. And then cornhole came around, you know, when I had children. I, they, there wasn't no, you can't, you, you can't spend sixty, seventy dollars to go play the nicest courses. And, and you can't, you can't be going four or five hours a day. So I was like, okay, I got to find something to do. You know, I'm still young. <laughs> I, I, I got to find something. And cornhole was really that outlet to get my competitive nature out in it. Well, that's, it's been a blessing. Interesting you bring up being a dad. And, and the reason I'm, I'm going to talk about this, I never had kids. And one of the reasons why being a fatherless boy I just, I didn't want to mess somebody else up, plain, plain and simple. I mean, what, what is it about, like, how would you say coming up without really a father has affected you being a father? Or has it at all, if you even think about it? Or, or is it a big part of, you know, this is what I would have liked to have had, so this is what I'm going to give my kids? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, me being a father is, is very important to me. It's, it's super important especially with my upbringing, I had five or six different people try to claim me as a child. You know, I, <laughs> uh, it's just one of those things, you know, where you, ha you set a different standard on being a father whenever you have an upbringing like mine. And my standard is that I want to, I don't want to give my children everything I didn't have. I want to teach my kids what I didn't know. You know, I can't, you can't fulfill a child by giving them a nice truck for their 15th birthday or filling up their gas tank for them or giving them, giving them the nicest clothes. You know, I want to teach my children that how to be a man and how to survive in this, in this world. Cause this world's tough. Once you get 20 plus and you out on your own, it's tough. And being a father is very, very important to me. And my cornhole game, I definitely had to take a back seat to that. But like I said, my child, my, my oldest son is nine. Now he's kind of getting the ropes of life and I'm getting to where I can get back into the game. So and and he's liking it. So it's, it's, it's like, a, it's, I'm fortunate. I'm very fortunate to be a father, to, to be where I'm at in life, and especially to still be competing at a high level, playing the game that I love. Yeah, I, I love this, Trevor. And this is, what, this is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, because I feel like I've never gotten a chance to really talk to you much about this stuff. I didn't even know you had kids. Are you, are you, still, yeah. are you still married? No. Uh, yeah, well, I like, I like to leave my private life my private life. Not everything <laughs> is for social media, you know. <laughs> hey, um, I, did, if you, I, I know you didn't, but if you were to listen to last week's show, you would know that I agree with you. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I tore, I tore up social media. <laughs> <laughs> we, we live in a day and age where everybody's got to know everything. And, yep. but, no. Okay, um, so where, 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 do, where, does that, where does that competitive fire come from that you play with? And, and, and just that anger and that passion, like where, do, where does that, where, where does that come from? I think I don't, I definitely wasn't born with a gift because my, I come from a family of fishermen. That's it. My, my father fished, my grandfather fished, my great grandfather fished, my, everybody in my family. That's all they did was they were just outdoorsmen. No, nobody really played sports, which my father was decent, but me, myself, my mind it's just it. It went so it clicked 
when I was in high school just because, you know, I was small. Like, I'm, I'm six foot now, but when I was 19 years old, I was 5'6". I was a really late bloomer. I was still, I was still 5'6 when I started playing cornhole. They were still taping me being, you know, 8, 19 years old, and I was short, you know. And, but oh. I bloomed late, and uh, the thing about me is I, I love sports. I always loved sports, but I just was always small. And I like to hang out with the big boys. My my older brother, he hung out with all the jocks and athletes. And so I would weight lift with them. I, I, they wouldn't pick on me because I, I can fight. You know, but I was <laughs> but I was always small. You know, I was always smaller than everybody. So it's just it was a I'm behind the eight ball anyways. You know, I'm not the most talented. I'm not the tallest. I'm not the strongest. I'm not the fastest. But I got this up here, though, and I got the, I got the heart. So I've always I've always learned how to fight from behind. And that's just like you- you, you are one of the, the the toughest son of a bitches that I've ever met. I can tell you that right now. And speaking of fighting, t- tell me about tell me about your boxing and why why boxing was part of your background. I, I know I know that you you fought competitive competitively briefly, but but why was boxing a big part of your background? Boxing was definitely a big part of my background. Not only just to let some anger out. You know, as a child, any, every kid, every boy needs to put a set of boxing gloves on. There's a lot of kids running around here now that needs to put, set of, put, put a set of boxing gloves on bad, <laughs> you know, but, um, <laughs> but it was, it was a big part of my life. And, uh, see, I got into some trouble when I was younger and was on house arrest for a year. And that's when the boxing really, and boxing and basketball came into play because, I, I had a lot of friends that played sports, you know, but me not being able to go anywhere in 10th grade, stuck at the house every day. I, every sing, everybody from everybody who was anybody came to the house. We had a big backyard and we, we had 10 sets of boxing gloves and we would just go. And I mean, we would, we would go from five o'clock in the afternoon to five o'clock in the morning and then wake up and do it again. And that was a ritual for four or five years. And it just, it be, it became a thing. It was it was almost like a, if we're getting together, somebody strapping the boxing gloves on today, you know. And then, I was this kid when I was sixteen, growing up with my my older brothers. You know, you know, I played basketball with the older kids. I, I hung out with the older kids with my older brother. So when it comes to boxing, was, well, don't nobody want to box a little kid no more. You know, don't nobody want to box a little kid. So wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Uh, are you are you violating the first rule of Fight Fight Club? You're talking about. Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah well, I, I, Tre- Trevor, do you hear any of us when we were before you came on what we were talking about as far as uh, like switching gears here on you? But like when we, you know, you're one of the players that when we first started miking up players, that you know, you're an emotional guy. No one has to worry about how Trevor Brooks is feeling when he plays, and sometimes that language is going to be a little adult. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily have a problem with it. But some of the higher ups and then some of the broadcast folks, you know, in the truck and then, you know, back in the home offices, they don't want to hear that. What do you think? Because I just want to connect it to what we were talking about earlier. Do you like the players being mic'd up or would you just rather not have to worry about that at all so you could just be yourself? Uh, firstly, I do like the players being mic'd up. Me, I've been mic'd up like three or four times and I've made some bad decisions, two or three of them. <laughs> But it's, it, it's, it becomes with maturity. I mean, this game is growing rapidly. So uh, as the game grows, the players have to grow too. We have to grow as professionals, and me especially. I have to grow as a professional if I'm going to have a future in this game. And, and this is what I, I, I put my eggs in this basket. This is what I want to do. I want to play, and I want to and I want to win. And I, and to win comes with a responsibility, and that's to carry yourself a certain way. And that's uh, the part of my game that I've been working on this offseason. And I think that I'm going to do a lot better job of. But if I could say anything to players that are that are going to be mic'd up that never have been or, you know, just from past experience, it's just be yourself. You want you have an audience of millions of people watching you, watching you do your craft, watching you. You, you practice. You, you, in this, do, you do this all day long at your house when you get to these stages and you get a chance to perform and you're mic'd up and you're trying to create an audience for yourself people that believe in you you know so stay authentic to yourself don't go up here trying to act like nobody else don't don't uh you know try to be anybody else other than yourself because at the end at the end of the day you're reaching millions and millions of people 
and the people that are going to resonate with you are your kind of people anyway. So don't put on any kind of false front of anybody that you're not. This is who I am. And granted, I could tone it down. There's a lot of things that I have learned over the years that I, that I plan to implement this year. But being raw and being myself won't be one of them. So that, that's, that brings up the next question. So are you capable, do you feel, of, of taking it down a notch? Like I've talked to Ryan Smith about this and other athletes who have played you know, at a high level of sports, and, and there's a switch. And, you know, even, even as a broadcaster, right. And I, and I get it. We're not in the heat of competition, but even as a broadcaster, as soon as that headset goes on, there's a switch, you know, what you can and cannot say, do you, do you think you have that ability to flip that switch? I mean, cause you are such a pat and it's not just you, it's others. I mean, do you, do you think that you can find that capability to flip that switch? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's, not, it's, it, it's not going to be as easy. It, it hasn't been as easy for me as others because I have such a, uh, you know, a, a no filter characteristics about myself. That's just the way I am. I'm, I was me before the cameras and I'm a, tr- I'm a do my best to, to put out there who I am. I'm trying to represent myself for, for myself, you know, so I'm going to be who I am, but within the guidelines of the, of the league that I'm playing for. Yeah. So I have to, I have to respect that. I just, you know, but when, when I want to play, see, all right. So me personally, someone that has played, look, high school sports, never played beyond that, but I played sports and there's times where you're going to talk. There's times where that chatter, it's just part of every other sport. And it mm-hmm. seems to be an issue with so many people in our game, but I would rather personally, just my opinion, I would rather watch you or Jordan power or whomever that's going to give me something. Yes. Just mm-hmm. give, give me something that lets me know that you're emotionally invested in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. I would rather watch that than watch a statue play. Now, that being said, you can't have a hundred people just going crazy, right? But just give me mm-hmm. something. Let me know that you're there emotionally. I just, I don't know. For- that you actually care, you know, that you yeah. that, that yeah. you care. But the thing is, is a, a lot of these kids are just so good and so talented. And the, the game is raw to them. They don't even know what they're getting themselves involved in yet. It's It's, it's true. But but um but the thing is, I will say, the last year or two, and I, you follow sports just like I do. Doesn't it seem like in in every other sport, players are getting mic'd up more? You know, they're starting to see, they're starting to get the in the inside of the ropes of football, basketball, and let let a player go off, let a player be mad. The the next day, the video goes viral. You know, yeah. it goes crazy, and they respect that, they love that because they're like, oh man, this guy that I've idolized my whole life actually has a mouthpiece on him. You know, because they're getting the inside ropes. But the thing about it is our sport ain't getting no respect. And players like me, we're gonna change we're gonna change the respect level of this game. They're gonna they're gonna respect us as athletes, not just bag tossers. And and uh we're in we'll show them. We'll show them this year. What's that? I love that. And I, I, so just man, th- this could again could be like a two hour <laughs> podcast. We've only got a few minutes left. So um, is it is it possible that this is kind of what we were talking about, Trevor? Would it would it be better to take the mics off and just let you all show that raw emotion? Or do you feel like you can still capture that? Do you think it's still possible to keep the mics on and do that? I think the mic's gotta stay on because it, granted right now it's this is trial and error period. You think of the NFL or the NBA when they're the first 10, 15 years. I mean, it was every year you're changing the rules, you're changing the format, you're changing the dates, you're changing the venues. Yeah. You gotta think you gotta think of this cornhole as is it's in baby stage. And everything is gonna change every year until we get it right. And when we get it right, and then we can once you got a foundation, because we ain't got a foundation yet, we're still changing rules. We're still changing the rule book. We're yeah. still changing we're still changing the rosters, we're still changing everything. There's nothing. There's all, no holes barred still today. It's, it's it's nothing but abstract art. That's all it is. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, actually. And and the players that are here, you guys, us guys, the commentators, the the CEO himself, we're in control of what, the the trajectory of this game right now, today, tomorrow, next year. We're in control of where this game goes. And I I classify myself as a captivating player, and I plan to go out there and win and captivate people. Do do you encourage that? I mean, do you do you guys, uh, as far as players go, do you do you tell other players, hey, listen, let's go, let's get some em- emotion here because I got I got to be honest with you, there have been many times, Trevor, where you know Trey and I are broadcasting and it's dead, the atmosphere is dead, and and we try to do everything we can on our end to control the broadcast and make it as clean and as pleasurable to watch at home as possible. But at the end of the day, it's up to you guys to bring that emotion. Do you guys ever talk about yeah. that? Well, see, when the players bring the 
bring the electricity, the commentation, the commentators, it's only better. Like you guys are a reflection of the intensity that's in the room, the energy that's in the room. Like you're the way you respond, the way you react to what's going on is a, is a reflection of the energy that's, that's in that room, you know? So it's up to the players. It's up to the players. Absolutely up to the players of, uh, Everything is up to the players of where this game goes. If we want to keep making a thousand bucks every time we go to a tournament, or we want some big boys to start calling us like me, my dream, my goal, I can put it out there. I want a sponsor like Oakley. I want a sponsor like Dick Sporting Goods. I want a sponsor like um, like Cabela's Outdoors. That's I want. I want that. And and my job this year is to get eyes on us and to get these guys to know that I'm the man out here that they want to represent. That I I want to represent that brand. So yes. This year right here is these next two or three years are crucial, crucial to the to the future of this game. That's, you know, I like that you hit on that because it's a lot. All right. So a lot of the younger kids I see, you know, take the gores out of this. But the younger generation of player, they're so quiet. And you talk about the energy in a room. Well, when you've got two players or four players that are playing and no one's saying a word. Right. Every, everyone's quiet. No one's saying anything. It's, you know, bags are flying within a second. Now, granted, I, I, I think there should be a shot clock. You don't need someone holding a bag for 25 seconds, but you can still think about talk about it for five, six, seven, eight, nine seconds and have real emotion kind of build in the building. But when everything is so fast, so quiet, I think it's hard for the crowd. It's hard for Trey and Jeff. It's hard for everyone to get lifted up by it. So I think you know, piggybacking on Jeff's question, like, does that ever get talked about between the players or is that just, hey, I am who I am. You be who you are. Well, see, the thing is, is you will notice you'd have to break that down into decades of playing because the older guys and stuff like that, they don't they don't rush like these newer kids do. And that comes down to just the respect of the game. You're like these kids are good, really, really good, but they're not. They got to understand how to play the game. And to be honest with you, when I come out, I was just like them. Yeah. I, I, when I come out when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, granted, it was still seven, eight years older than them, but I played <laughs> yeah. fast. I couldn't yeah. get the bag out of my hand fast enough. I'm like, <laughs> send it. Go, 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 go. And I'm like, the game's over before you know it. You didn't have fun. You don't remember a shot you hit. I mean, you got to treat this game like it's art. You got to respect this game. If you want it to go any, any higher, like this to be a valued and respected professional sport, the professionals themselves had to start respecting the game and we got to start treating it as such. And me, that's why I've changed my game and elevated it in the last year or two, because I want to be one of those players. I will be one of those players to transcend the game, to help show other players how to do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're good. Uh, you're, you're good. But are you going to drive all the way from Ohio down to Texas and play for three days and not have a lick of fun? You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> Like I just showed up and said, "Hey to everybody," threw my bags and went home. I don't even remember anything I did. No, go in there and get out, get the hour early, get your proper warm up in, play your tournament the way you're supposed to play your tournament. Get into your focus like you practice at home. How you get into your in your focus level, work on your rhythm. That's how you get better, and that's how the game's going to get better. It ain't just show up and, and throw twelves and go home. Nope. Because hey, the Trevor, game is. Of, we we are out of time, unfortunately, man. Uh -huh. Every time, every time. Y yep. Um, we got we got to get Trevor Brooks part two at some point. I know we'll have you on again. And Trevor, I, I yeah, not to put pressure on you, but you are you and your type of personality is what is going to take this this sport to another level. I agree with you a hundred percent. I was just having this conversation with anyone who would listen in Arizona a couple weeks ago that if we want a Nike, if we want an Under Armour, if we want an Adidas to ever get interested in the sport and say, wait a second. How about we make some bags? That's what's going to take this to the next level. And to do that, it takes someone not only with talent, but somebody with personality and passion. And, dude, you've got the trifecta. I mean, you really do. So, I mean, it, you, you and your type of personality um, is, is so critical to the future of the sport. But I appreciate you, brother. I love watching you. Love your passion mm -hmm. and, and your love of the game. And, uh, man, loved having you on. And we'll, we'll do it again for sure. Yeah, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Now, one more thing. Bernie, I just want to say, dude, you have my most respect. Like, you literally, there's a lot of people that come and go in this game, and there always will be. But for somebody to call it like they see it, you know, not just sit here and crunch numbers and, and trying to, every, a lot of people are trying to push this game so fast. 
so fast in any other sport just with it's, it's all about numbers i don't want to see a face i don't want to see a bag i don't want to see a situation i just want to see what numbers and that's not the way the game's going to go if the eye test still matters yep the, the eye test will always matter and as long as you're here that i know that eye test will always be important in acl so i you gotta have my utmost respect and jeff i don't know you well but thank you for having me on your show and i and i look forward to coming back appreciate it brother uh appreciate that and and uh and just rest assured, I'm going to edit all those nice things you just said about Bernie out of this week. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't edit that. <laughs> all, right. all right, dude. Hey, we got to run. Thanks, brother. We'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Have a good night. All right, you too. All right, Trevor Brooks, we got to go. We're like a minute over. All, all right, right, dude. He's awesome. Got to have him back. Absolutely. The best. All right, man. I'll talk to you next week. Yes, sir. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you.